All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining. Uh, we're about to start. My name is Philippe Ozil. I'm Principal Developer Evangelist at Salesforce, and I'd like to welcome you to this session. Today, I'm going to talk about using JavaScript and Jest to test web components. What's on our agenda for today? Uh, before actually I jump into the agenda, I need to give you the forward-looking statement. Uh, we, uh, Salesforce, is a publicly traded company, so you need to make your buying decisions based on what is commercially available in the product. Now, the good news is that I'm not going to talk about uh, Salesforce products here. I'm more going to talk about technology, which is not necessarily covered in the forward-looking statement. On our agenda today, I'll be talking a bit about the web components. So I'm going to make sure that everyone starts uh, with the same understanding. So I'll do a quick refresher on the technology, uh, the key standards here. And then I'll talk a bit about Jest. First of all, I'll talk about Jest, uh, not necessarily in the context of web components. But then I will move to another part in which I will actually talk about testing web components with Jest. And I'll finish with a set of common patterns and tips, uh, which makes you um, basically use the most out of uh, this technology with best practices. All right. This being said, uh, at any time you can ask questions in the uh, little uh, Go Webinar uh, dialog. Uh, make sure you ask questions there. Uh, I'm not going to interrupt the presentation to answer questions, but at the end there will be time for Q and A. So make sure you pop in those questions in the question box there. Thanks. Now, without further ado, let's start with the first uh, topic here, a refresher on web components. So what are web components? Uh, to put it very simply, it's a set of web standards, and there are actually three main standards that are part of web components. The first one is custom element, which lets you add uh, custom uh, elements to the set of HTML elements that are part of HTML5. Then there, there's also something called Shadow DOM. I'll go more in details on that. But it's an extension of the document object model DOM, which basically represents a web page as a tree uh, with elements that are the HTML tags. And finally, the third and um, um, third addition to those set of standards is HTML templates, which is uh, a new uh, HTML tag, but is also part of HTML5. I'll also talk more about this. But what's the use of web components? Well, I've, I've tried to summarize this into a single sentence, and I want to um, stress out a few words in that sentence. First of all, I'm going to read it. Uh, a web components enable to build monitor content through encapsulation and isolation. Now, this definition is, is really interesting because when you apply this to uh, testing, it makes a whole lot of sense because there are key concepts here that makes web components it's very uh, easy to be tested. So the fact that it's modular, this means that you can basically test uh, your components individually and then assemble them together. Then encapsulation mean, means that all the logic of a component is actually in the component itself. And isolation added to that means that the logic and, um, the, for example, the style of a component doesn't leak to the other components. So this is very good because when we test our components, we can test our components individually and work with the rest of the application in some sort of black box mode. We only test one component at a time. We don't have a full broad vision of the app. So this is particularly interesting for testing and I'll get back to that when we look at some code. So let's now take a look more in details uh, on those uh, different standards. The first one is custom elements. So this is, uh, from a high-level perspective, this is what you need to write to build a uh, custom element. This is to create, for example, in this sample code here, a hello custom element. Now, you would add this hello tag that you see at the bottom here inside a, uh, an HTML page, and it would render normally. What is interesting in the sample code is that on top here, you have some uh, ECMAScript 6 uh, construct here. It's a class here, but it's exported. And what's interesting is the extends HTML element. So HTML element is part of the standard. This is what defines the set of elements. So my hello web component is a class that extends the base components that are part of HTML. And then there is some JavaScript code here that I haven't really detailed in this particular slide here, but we'll take a look at that later on. But the idea is that 
it starts with a bit of JavaScript, and this JavaScript is actually the one that is going to be driving the behavior of your component. Once you have declared your component, another thing to do is to, to declare it and attach it to the list of custom elements. And this is the next line here. Custom elements is already predefined. Uh, it's a special variable, but it's part of the web specification, which lists all the custom elements that are available in a page. So by default, of course, it is empty, and it's up to you to define new elements. There are two, two arguments to that, uh, the name of the tag, so hello is the name of the tag, and then the class that represents uh, the custom element. So hello web component up here describes the behavior of our hello component. And then we can use this hello tag here in our standard HTML once we have defined and configured the class. So that's the first standard we use. This is probably the most powerful one, but it's just the beginning. After that, we have another thing which is also super powerful. That's called Shadow DOM. So DOM stands again for Document Object Model. And the idea even bef before the standard is that a web page is basically rendered as a tree. And the tree lists all the tags, all the elements encapsulated into one each other. With the Shadow DOM, we have the possibility to actually create some sort of subtree as part of a document object model. And now this subtrees can be isolated and encapsulated uh, in a self-contained or open um, subtree, basically. So I've taken a um, little uh, image from the Mozilla documentation network that explains this very well. You have your main uh, document tree. You declare a, a Shadow DOM. This Shadow DOM is the, the, the part in gray here, and it's attached to the main document using a Shadow Host. So you're taking basically everything that is under this, and you're isolating it in something called a shadow, a shadow tree. Now, the shadow tree can have its own elements, just like standard HTML, but the thing is, the document would maybe not see what is under the shadow DOM. And so you'll see that there are different types of shadow DOM. It can be self-contained, open, or closed. So basically, you can hide the implementation detail of a shadow DOM by making it, uh, turning it into a, a black box, basically. Below, I've pasted the, the code you should now be familiar with that creates a new uh, HTML element, a custom element. And we can see here that we have added an extra line here, which uh, creates a shadow DOM for our custom element. And this one is in open mode. So this means that you can still look at the source code of this uh, subtree, basically. Now, you, you can also work, again, in black box, but this is maybe a bit, um, a bit advanced for now. Like, for, for the context of this webinar, we'll, we'll work with open mode, uh, but be aware that they exist. Finally, uh, the, the, third and, um, the third standard that is really important in terms of web components is the HTML template standard. This one is very easy to understand. It's uh, a, a new tag, actually two new tags. Here I'm only showing one, but there's the template tag and the slot tag, which are part of HTML5 that had been added to the list of standard HTML elements. And these elements uh, are, are there to basically declare a block of HTML which is not rendered when the page is displayed. And this is an easy way to basically have some placeholder code which can be copy pasted basically on the page and can be rendered whenever you want. So on the left uh, code snippet here, you see a template which just contains a paragraph and we have an ID to identify this particular template. Now on the, on the right side, you have a custom element and this time I've added a bit more uh, logic to it. In this custom element, you see that now I have, uh, I'm, I'm grabbing the template with a document get element by ID. So this grabs my template element and I'm actually attaching a shadow DOM. So I'm opening a shadow DOM in, with the open mode and I'm attaching the content of the template to that particular uh, shadow DOM. So I'm placing this, uh, this HTML here inside a custom element that is wrapped around a shadow DOM. So this may seem seems like a lot of code and um, a lot of complexity, but the reality is that it's going to be very simple for for you to use because generally you don't use vanilla web components. You try to, you generally want to use a uh, a framework to use those web components so that you don't have to copy all of this verbose code around. And with that, there are multiple options. 
But with Salesforce, we, we have taken a, a specific approach to that problem and we've introduced lining web components. Uh, the idea here is that it's a combination of the standard web components uh, with the shadow DOM, custom element, and templates. And we've made all of that simpler to use with a bit of syntactic sugar and tooling. So we basically create a couple of shortcuts and uh, tools that lets you write those different uh, lines of code for you, but in a much simpler way. But not only that, we also added polyfills for legacy browsers because, uh, for example, we're using that technology on our own platform and we have to support legacy browsers like IE11. So IE11 is still not up to date and won't be up to date actually on the latest web standards. So we have to compensate for the lack of shadow DOM, we have to compensate for the lack of custom elements. And so we've, we've, um, we've added those polyfills to make it transparent. Now, in this uh, in today's session, I'll use Lightning Web Components as an example for how to test web components. But the same exact principles apply with Vanilla Web Components. The, structure, the, the syntax is a bit more, more verbose when you use Vanilla Web Components, but the same principles can be applied. Now with that, I want to show you uh, the application on which we're going to work for today. And we're going to use a, a sample application uh, that you can build uh, from, a, from an online learning material called a conference app. And we're going to see um, how this is built. So I'm just going to jump now to a um, to this particular screen here. And this is uh, an application which is built with web components. So let's take a look first before we explore the application at the source code. So I'm opening my developer tools. Let me make it very big so that everyone can see it. All right, I can't really increase the font size here. But what's interesting here and is that this page is, is built with several components. So I'm going to explore a bit, uh, actually, the structure of the page. And here you'll notice that we have already our first custom element. My app is a custom element that is defined just as you saw before with uh, an HTML element. And it contains a shadow room. So that's a shadow DOM. This one is in open mode. And then it contains its own uh, style, its own code, and also its own JavaScript. So my entire app is actually wrapped in this my app uh, custom element. And if we explore it further down, there are other components like my session list, which represents the list of session for our conference application. Right? So this is all using standard HTML. Uh, this is just a regular web page. And what we just did to generate that particular structure here is using Lightning Web Components or LWC here. And all of that has been generated in this JavaScript file, which is really standard JavaScript. So just so that I finish with this particular app, uh, there are just a few functionalities in that, just basic filtering, and also uh, a way to open uh, the sessions. Now, this is just the detail of a session. You can see a speaker card and a bit of title, dates. Now, for the sake of our uh, exercise today and to add a bit more complexity to the project, the data that is featured here in our application is coming from the Salesforce platform. So we have an integration and we have a server running uh, on the Salesforce platform. This is something you'll probably have uh, in, a, in a custom use case. You probably have to do uh, network calls with fetch or something else to retrieve um, data. All right. So that's the application we're going to work with. And this is the high level view of how we use web components to create this application. Now, if you just look at the code here, you can tell the fact that it's being built with Lightning Web Components or with another framework. It's really standard code that is being rendered here. Now, let's jump into uh, Jest. So, I'm going to go back to the slides now and I'm going to present a bit what Jest is and how it can be used to test those web components. So, let me introduce you to Jest. So, what is Jest? Um, Jest is one of the many uh, JavaScript testing frameworks, but it's probably one of the most popular because it's the one that has um, a very good value in terms of speed features and documentation. There is an incredibly active community around it, and it's been around for quite some time. So the functionalities are really rich. So it's something we've, uh, we've, we've taken a, a lot of time to study the different frameworks, and we, we partnered with Jest to create Lightning Web Components. So that's something we really pushed forward because it's a great tool. This is not something that was created by Salesforce. This was uh, open sourced by Facebook and it's been around for around, uh, at least 10 years, I'd say. What is great about Jest is that 
it's uh, a really modern approach. Uh, the idea is that it's first uh, designed to work in uh, with vanilla JavaScript and vanilla HTML, but there are extensions that let you use it for custom frameworks. So, for example, you can use Jest with Vue, with React, with other frameworks. You can probably use it also with Polymer or Lit Element if you want to use other frameworks which support uh, web components. But another thing that is really interesting with uh, Jest is that it supports a virtual DOM with something called JS DOM. So generally, uh, when you're running tests, uh, you can be running your tests on your local machine, but you can also be running those tests in a continuous environment. Uh, and that, if you're running your tests in a CI system, it's generally a headless server, meaning that it has no screen, so it probably has no browser. But with JS DOM, we have the ability to simulate the rendering of a web page just in memory with fake elements. So you can simulate all the tags that are being displayed, and you can actually browse those tags just like if you were using the, the normal um, web APIs to explore DOM. So for example, document get element by ID or uh, query selectors would work with JS DOM, except you're not rendering the page, the page behaves just like it, is, it were being shown. So JS DOM is very interesting because it lets you really test the behavior of your components without the ability to display them. That's really powerful for what we're going to do. Now, um, how does this work from an environment standpoint? Jest is, works on Node.js, uh, so even though we don't need Node.js to render our pages because our pages work with JavaScript that runs natively in the browser, we do need to have Node.js to run our tests. And this is why Jest is part, along with other dependencies, of the dev dependencies. So these are the dependencies that are just needed um, basically for the build of our environment and for the test of our, of our environment. It's not required at runtime. Along with Jest, I recommend uh, that you use ESLint, and uh, I will talk more about ESLint uh, in the next slide. But the idea is that we have built extensions for these two things, for Jest and ESLint, that are specific web components. And if you use another framework that works with web components, you can have your own extensions to that. But these two work great together, Jest and ESLint, because they're very modular and flexible. Of course, now that you have set up your Node.js environment, you can probably add your own custom dependencies. If you want something for formatting code, like Prettier, you can add to that list of dependencies, but all of that is optional. Talking about Jest, uh, that's ESLint, sorry. So for those who are not familiar with ESLint, uh, this is uh, something called a linting utility. It's a static code analysis tool, which lets you detect problems in your code without even running it. Now, ESLint is kind of the only option to uh, lint JavaScript code. It's the most popular, and I don't think it has serious competition from any other linter. So that's why I'm suggesting this one. It's quite flexible because it comes with a large set of rules which are customizable. Uh, you can deactivate things, activate things. It's, um, from a strict standpoint, it's not required for testing, but I really recommend it because it covers both your, the code of your components and the code that you're testing. And here, and you can see on the screenshot, an example of what I mean by linting, uh, it can detect problems like this here, uh, a test that is missing an assertion. So it basically a test that does nothing. So linting does a lot of other things like de detecting unused variables, uh, detecting duplicate names for classes, things like that. It's very convenient because it lets you make sure you have um, like robust code even before actually trying it out and deploying it. So yeah, I really recommend yes, lint. Now, going back to Jest, um, I'm going to highlight just a few useful features. I will demonstrate those features when I talk about um, developing and testing uh, web components. So I'm not going to go in details right now, just to point out these high-level features that are really unique to Jest and are very interesting. Like most uh, testing tools, uh, Jest has the ability to generate code coverage, and you can see that it, uh, when, we, when we're going to run a code coverage analysis, but this is pretty detailed down to the line numbers that are not covered by your, your tests. So this is very valuable. It gives you an average of code coverage of your project. It's super, super useful. Next, next uh, valuable feature is the watch mode. So I'm going to demonstrate that again uh, just next. The idea with the watch mode is that you have um, a script that is constantly, constantly analyzing uh, the content of your code and it runs the tests 
each time you, you change your source code. Whether you change your product source code or just the application or the test code, it will rerun the code each time you save your files. And this lets you work in a really uh, TDD test-driven uh, development environment because on the one side of your screen, you can put the watch mode, which constantly runs the test. And on the other side of the screen, you could have your actually app implementation. So you can basically code and test at the same time. That's very really valuable. You don't have to trigger the test manually each time. And watch mode is super interesting because it, it's intelligent enough to detect the changes in your code and only run the specific tests that are affected by the changes you made. It's not running all the tests of your product each time, it's just intelligent to pick the right test. So it's actually super fast. Another thing which is uh, really valuable with Jest is mocking abilities. Uh, you can mock, mock also the things with Jest and uh, things like timers or synchronous code can be mocked and um, network requests, things like that. Very, very valuable. On top of that, it's uh, very flexible in terms of configuration. Uh, I mentioned earlier there are lots of different plugins that you can use. Uh, for example, one of the plugins you can consider when you're developing um, a web component application is a plugin that replaces the uh, fetch API. So when you're when you're working on the browser, you have access to a set of web APIs which are not necessarily available in a Node.js environment. So one of the simplest examples of that is the fetch API. When you're in the browser, you can use the fetch methods to to trigger network requests. So that's the new replacement for XHR requests. You can use that to do AJAX, basically. But when you're in Node.js, Node.js does not know about the Fetch API. So here comes a great plugin that lets you mock this, um, this, um, these um, requests. You can just put a plugin to mock the, um, the Fetch API on the Jest side of things so that you can run your tests in Node.js without having to support the uh, Fetch API. Not only that, but you can also uh, use something called module remapping. And I have an example for that when I go into the code uh, of my application. You can actually replace entire modules that are imported with your own implementation. So for example, if you're importing something from a third-party dependency, at test time, you can actually replace that import by, by your own custom code. So you can easily stub any kind of module that you're importing with your own code for just the sake of testing. So that's actually very, very powerful. All right, so these are just a couple of uh, useful Jest features. There are plenty more, but these are the ones I wanted to highlight here, and I will show you that uh, when we go next in the demonstration, All right? That being said, let's talk again now about web components. Let's recenter the talk around this key feature. So how does it work? How do you add tests for a web component? So what we have to do basically is to create Jest tests. For those web components. Now, what you see here is the folder structure and file structure uh, for a particular component. In the case of uh, Lightning Web Components, what, what our tooling and syntactic sugar lets you do is basically create a folder per component. So hello is our component. And in that folder, you'll find the HTML for the templates and the JavaScript for the um, for a particular component. Now, of course, your application contains more than one component. So you'll see as many folders as there are components as many uh, HTML and JavaScript files under there. Now, the power of Lightning Web Components, of course, is that it just regroups all of that, compresses it, and ships all of that as a single JavaScript file for you so that the browser only have to load one single file. But that's what is specific to, uh, to Lightning Web Components. Going back to Jest now, Jest uses this particular structure here, underscore, underscore, test, underscore, underscore, to identify the folders which contains its test. And then it also uses files which are .test.js. So if you leave .test.js files, uh, Jest will automatically scan for them and detect them and run the tests that these files contain. So mix those two things together, mix lining of components with Jest, and this is the structure you, you obtain. For each component, you have this test folder with the um, with one or many test files in that particular folder. Now let's have a look at the test file. How is it structured? Um, Jest works with a set of different things. The high-level entity is a test suite, and there can be multiple test suites. Uh, generally, we only have one per component, but you can have sub suites if you want. 
And as a convention, what we generally tend to do is put the name of the component as the top level name of the suites. Of course, you can, oops, sorry, you can divide that after with subcases like testing network requests, requests on one side and doing rendering tests on the other. Then uh, another keyword which is interesting is the teardown instructions. Um, when you're going to do um, web components testing, you'll most always need uh, teardown instructions because we'll see that you generally have to do some cleanup after your tests. This is not something specific to Lightning Web Components, but it's specific to the way you write your test. You need basically to clear your test page because you'll be adding components to your test, test page and you'll be reusing the same test page across multiple tests. So you wanna make sure you start from something clean. So each time you finish a test, you clean up everything you did on the page so that the next test can use the same page, but in a clean state. And finally, the last bit, which is the one you'll see the most, is the test itself. Uh, what is interesting here is the fluent syntax. And you can see that you can read this line of code really simply. It's just a sentence that you can read. It displays greeting. So in the context of this particular hello component, which is basically a hello world component, we should test here, but the component does display hello something. Right? That's what the test says. So there are two arguments here, the name of the test, which is a string, of course, and then the function which runs to do the test. So I'm not showing the function yet. I'll show that later on. But first, before we dive into how you write a test, let's take a look at what, uh, what are the three main phases when you do the testing. So this, is, this uh, next section here is really generic. It's not only when you do uh, JavaScript testing, it works also for any other language. The idea is that you want to break your tests into three phases, which are given, when, then. In given phase, you prepare your test. So you, you prepare your resources that you're going to test. And for example, this can mean like adding uh, a doc, a, an element to a page, uh, initializing some variables. Then you move on to the next phase, which is the when. And this is the actual behavior testing that you're going to run. So for example, it's clicking on a button, which should trigger a behavior. And finally, the then phase is where you run your assertions. So when you're actually checking the result of your action that you performed in the when phase. So let's see how we translate those three different phases and how we apply them to uh, just testing. All right, we start with given. With the given phase, uh, most of the time we do the same thing. We actually add our web element or web component to the page. So this uh, code that you see here is how you could add a custom element with a bit of syntactic sugar again, create element is what we would register the element, name of the component and the class of the component. We set some uh, public properties of our component here. This particular property has a contact uh, property that it exposes. We assign it with a constant and then we append that to our test page. So what we're doing here is that we have a blank page. We add our web component to the page. That's the given phase. The next, th next phase we're going to run is the when phase. And on the when phase, we actually try to simulate some behavior. So this can be either clicking on the button, which is the first example you, show, you see here, or it can be entering some text in an input field. Now, all that you see here is very standard code, but this is nothing to do with Lightning Web Components. This is pure standard code. What is interesting here, but I want to highlight, is that you'll notice the shallow root here element, uh, that property here that is in the middle. We're not accessing our elements by using a document query selector. We actually, we're actually using a shallow root to directly locate our, uh, our elements within the shallow root of our web components. So this uh, restricts a bit the range of search to just our components. So that even if we left something else from another test, we wouldn't be looking into that. We're really looking at just what our component does. So two things we're doing in this example, clicking on a button or even simulating uh, someone typing in a text field. And you'll notice that this is just a regular HTML input. But if you want to react to a particular change, we would also have to send manually a change event. The change event is actually something standard. Here we're declaring as a custom event because we need to fire it. But if you remember uh, the HTML spec, you have on change on the input element, and this would trigger the on change by dispatching an event called change. 
So if you have a function that is reacting to on change, this is how you would uh, trigger it by firing a custom event called changed on the input. So that's the when phase. Now let's move to the third and final phase of the assertion phase. This is where really all the power of Jest uh, can be seen. Uh, what is interesting here again is the fluent syntax. And although you probably never used Jest before, if you read those three code samples, you can pretty much understand them because they can be read like a sentence. So what is interesting here is that they're divided into two parts. The first part is uh, an expect statement which targets the element we're going to check and then the assertion value which is a composition of different matchers. So if I read them, expect div co text content to be hello something or expect mock select handler to have been called one time. And you can see this is really a sentence. Now Jest is really powerful because it has a whole range of matchers that you can uh, attach and chain together. Here, for example, the not to be null is very interesting because you have a negation in the middle of it. And so instead of having just um, a traditional assertion with two, um, two expressions here, we can compose the different matchers to build some sort of sentence. And this is quite powerful because not only just provide a whole range of matchers, it also allows you to write your own matchers. So when you're doing more advanced testing, you can chain custom matchers to all of that. So this is a really flexible environment for you to perform tests. All right. Now, before I jump into the common patterns and tips, uh, I'm going to take a short break and go back to the code. And I'm going to show you how we apply all of these techniques uh, running tests with Jest on the conference app we just saw before. So um, back to my, um, to, to my application. So we're going to see several tests. Um, we're going to start with going back to the, um, to the to the main page here when we have a list of sessions. And I'm going to show you how we run a couple of tests with different scenarios. So this is um, this application runs in here. Uh, it's currently running on my local machine here. And let's take a minute first to look at the structure of the project. We're looking at a uh, Lightning Web Components project. Of course, if you're using vanilla Web Components, the structure will be a bit different. But again, just to remind you about the key concepts here, we have a source directory with a client part, and we also have a server running. Uh, I'm not going to show the server for this particular test. But what I want to show you is you have modules in the client, and under my here, which acts a bit as a namespace, we have a set of components. The top level one is app, and that's the one you saw when you looked at when we looked at the source code. So if you just look at the page here, the main content we see is index HTML. And what we're going to do here is that we're going to replace this main div by our web components, and we're going to attach our, our web components to this uh, main div. And this is what index does here. It's creating a MyApp component with the MyApp class, which is this one here, JavaScript class here, and it's appending it to the document. So let's take a look at our first web component, the MyApp web component a class here, which extends a lining element. So for the sake of um, adding a bit of tooling for you, we've not directly extended HTML element, but we've actually created a, a, an intermediate class called lining element, which itself extends a, the standard HTML element. Now, this particular class is very simple. We have just two variables in there, a session ID and a state. The state tells us which page, which view we're looking at. It's either the list view for all the sessions or um, a detailed view for just a single, um, a single session. And session ID holds the ID of a specific session we have clicked when we have opened a session. All right? We start by showing a, a list of sessions and then we render the page. Now, before I jump more into the JavaScript code, I just want to show you the HTML here. The HTML is embedded between this standard template tag, which is part of HTML5 again, and this is the code of our component. You'll notice that we have also other template tags that we use to do conditional rendering. So with that, we can either toggle the my session list component, which holds the list of all sessions, or the my session details uh, web component, which holds the view of a single uh, session. All right. Now, in terms of tests, so if we start with just a single uh, single 
web components here, just looking at the app, even without knowing what my session list is or my session details is, we have uh, the opportunity to test a few things. First of all, we want to check the default uh, state of the page here when we just display it uh, and we just initialize the application. Then we can also make sure that we're able to toggle from one view to the other, where we're able to toggle to the state details view uh, when we click on a particular session. And that's what we're going to do. So let's jump now into the test folder and let's look at our jest test files. Before I talk about individual tests, uh, just a reminder on the key structures here. This is the first level uh, thing, um, the first level um, not element function, which is uh, the, the, uh, the jest suite. It has a name with the name of just the component and then a function which lets us declare the different uh, tests or um, lifecycle hooks, basically. And here we're using a teardown instruction here after each, it, this runs after each test. And what this is doing is basically clearing the JS DOM. So it's clearing the virtual web page on which we attach our elements. And this is just a loop that removes everything that is on this virtual web page. So that when we run our tests, like this test here, for example, we create a web component and we attach it to the page. So this is the given. There is no then on this one because this is just default behavior. And then there is the, the then phase which we do in which we do the assertion. So we create the element, we attach the element to the page, we then access the shadow room of that element and we look for a, the presence of a my session list custom element. And so what this test does then, it expects that this custom element is not null. So we found our session list element. When you put that side to side with the, um, sorry, when you put that side to side with the template, you, you can see clearly what it does. So we attach the my app element. So this is taking the content of this template here, injecting it in our web page. And then later on, it's checking that it can find the my session list element, which is supposed to be here. So it makes sure that it's being displayed by default when we, so that by default we're showing a session list. Pretty simple, no user interaction on that particular test, it's just a default test. Now, if we look at the more advanced test here, this is uh, something that will require a bit of human interaction or normally should, it, should require some human interaction. So the test reads, it, it displays session details when navigating to a session. So navigating to a session means that we have clicked on a session tile on the session list. When this happens, we can see that this element, custom elements here, web component exposes a navigate event and we are reacting to that navigate event with handle navigate. So let's take a look at this handle navigate function to see what it does before we actually explore the test even further. This handle navigate function uh, receives an event and it extracts a session ID from this event and it toggles the state of the application to show the details view. So we know which session is selected and then we switch to the session details after that. When we're changing those property values here, session ID and state, this will actually change the value of our uh, getters down there so that if state details become true, we're, we're switching the state to details. And this refreshes the, the page here because this becomes false. We're no longer in state list, but we're now in state details, which means we're showing a my session details web component and we're passing down the session ID value that we just received from our handle navigate or navigate events, I should say. So that's what we're going to try to test in this particular uh, test here. Let's take a look now at how the test is built. Same same code here. We just create the my app um, component and we attach it to the test to the page for testing. Then what we do is that we uh, try to see if we have the session list. So we, we grab the session list, but remember that by default it is uh, displayed. We prepare a, an event, which is a um, navigate event and we attach some data to it. In that case, we're preparing a mock session ID. So we attach, um, we, we pass a fake ID to our event and we fire on that particular web component session list, which is this one, a custom event called navigate with the data that we just prepared with a fake session ID. 
So when we do that, this fires the event and the handler here detects that event and should react. So this is really, this is the when phase. We're simulating a user click on one of the sessions that is in my session list. And the then phase, which is when we're going to try to run our assertions, it's enclosed in a promise. So why isn't that just in line here, just like the other test? Well, it's enclosed in a promise because we need to leave, to leave a few milliseconds for the framework to re-render the page. Because the state has changed the template or toggling uh, these two templates, and so there's a little rebranded time. This is not much, but it's just it, by having a resolve promise, this just waits for what is called a tick on the server, which just waits a fragment of a millisecond to render the next uh, to run the next test instruction. So that's the last part. Our test is run after a millisecond. What we're doing is that we're trying to grab the my session details element, which is here, and we're making sure that it's not null, so that we're displaying a particular session. Now, at this point, we're not even checking which session is displayed. We could also uh, do that, make sure we are running the right uh, session ID there, but it's uh, the same value as the mock session ID. So let me actually do that. I'm going to take this opportunity to show you the watch mode. So I'm going to run, I stopped my application. You can see now in the console down there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a few uh, just features. So I'm going to do npm run. By and this will trigger my um, my different scripts there that I've declared, and the one I want to call out is test unit. I've named it this way. You can also you can name it the way you want, but this is calling Jeff behind the scene. And first, I'm going to show you the coverage before I run into uh, running the test itself. When I run coverage, it will run all the tests of my application, and it will show me a detailed statement. Or what is the code coverage? And here you can see all the status of my different uh, test files. And we can see down to the detail of the, the lines that are not covered um, by the source code. So here it's pretty good. Uh, we have an average, uh, it's not so good. I mean, we have only have an average of 32% code coverage, but I have only tested what is in the client side. I haven't really tested what is on the server side, which is a bit more complex. And you can see it, it takes a lot of other lot of, lot of lines. So that's good enough for today. Now, I only wanted, I wanted to show you that, but I, what I'm going to use now is also the watch mode so that I can actually run tests live. Now I'm going to fire the watch mode from Jest. And what the watch mode does again is that it constantly checks for source code and, and try to find if anything changes to, uh, to trigger, um, to detect uh, changes. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to break my test on purpose. Uh, we're going to take. We're, we're still working on the on the on the test that does a check that we're navigating. But this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break it by removing the dispatch event. So just to show you that this test works, I'm going to remove this line which just uh, sends the navigation event, and we're going to see that the test will fail because we will not be able to see the my session details element. So I've still I saved my file, and you can see that just ran, and it found that. Uh, my assertion is broken. So this is the test that we were running, display session details when navigating session, and it did not find the session detail element. So this assertion failed. It was null, but it wasn't supposed to be null. So now if I correct my text, my test by putting that back the uh, navigation signal and I save my, my file, you'll see that it will rerun again, and this time everything passes. So that's a really simple test. Uh, let's now move into a more advanced use case. This uh, particular um, component doesn't require any server data, but if you look at the server list, the session list, sorry, the session list is actually going to require some, um, some network data. So if we go in the uh, session list components, which lists all the session as its name implies, uh, there is a call to a get session function here. This get session function is calling an API on the server to retrieve the list of sessions and it's saving it on a local variable. And uh, we actually have two local variables, and one which is all values and another one which is the filtered value. Um, so what happens here? Uh, get session is declared in another module. Uh, that's very simple. It's actually here, the session service. And this is just using the fetch API to run a net network request on a specific API endpoint. Uh, 
So that's good, but remember that uh, the tests are running on Node.js, they're not running in the browser, so Node.js does not know about the Fetch API, which is standard for browsers. So how do we replace that? And actually, how do we want this to work even without, without being connected to a server, actually? Because the tests are running on your own local environment, it does not need to be connected to a server. So here we're going to use something, another feature from Jest, which is quite powerful. We're going to use module remapping. So I'm going to go, jump now to Jest configuration. Jest config here is the standard name for my configuration. It's just using the standard Jest config for Lightning Web Components, but here I've added something which is very specific to my project called Module Remapper. And what you see here is that I created a custom version of my service session service, which is supposed to load my sessions, and I've created a mock version of the service that I've placed in another folder. So now, when we run the code that is uh, in the session list here, instead of retrieving the actual uh, data service here, we're going to use a mock service, which is stored in this particular folder. And this here is just using hard-coded data. By default, it returns nothing, and we can uh, set in advance with this function what it will return. So this removes all um, the necessity to have any uh, network connection. You can just run all this offline, and you can specify which sessions are going to be returned manually. So that's the first step. Now, the other step is actually to pre prepare some test data. And for my session list test, I have created two JSON files, one file, which is JSON file, which is just empty, no sessions, and another file, which mocks the structure of actual session records. So here, that's returning two sessions uh, with no speakers and just dummy names. How are we using all of that together? Let's take a look at the session list test. So this one is a bit more advanced. I, I'm not going to read through all of it, but I want to point out the key concepts here. The first thing that we're going to use is um, importing the JSON files which contain our mock data. So here we grab the two, two files which are declared on the data with just the test data with no sessions or multiple sessions. And then we use also this particular function here that we saw from this, the mock service, which allows us to specify what the service will, will return when it's being called. And finally, we run our test. So the first one here is returning no sessions, so checking how the web component will behave when there are no sessions being returned by the network. So we initialize the mock to return no session, we create the session list element, a web component, and we attach it to our page. And then we look at our web component and see that we have no session elements. There's no session line being added. So there are zero, uh, zero sessions displayed. So that's the basics, testing without no session. Let's look at the next one. Kind of same structure, except this time we set multiple sessions in the mock. So this time we'll return the two sessions that are defined in our JSON. We attach the web component to the page. And here, uh, we're going to wait a bit for refresh the page, wait for the network call here uh, for the get session promise to resolve. And finally, we're going to test for our sessions, and we're going to see that we have as many session elements as there are elements in the multiple sessions array. So that's a quick way to test that our component displays the right sessions. Of course, we can go more in details and look at the titles and names of the sessions, but here, this is just a basic test to make sure that we have the right sessions displayed. Notice that I didn't have to change my uh, get session service. Uh, we're still running this code here, except, oh no, sorry, this code here, except this here is not using the data session service, it's using the mock service, mock session service. All of that is done transparently with Jest. So that's a more advanced use case, but just to show you the flexibility of Jest. That's it for this particular component. I'm going to jump back to the slide. We need to move forward with our content here. I can talk more about that in the Q&A section. I'm going to leave you with a few uh, tips and tricks, best practices on how to run efficient tests. So first of all, let's take a step back. When we write a lot of tests, there are recurrent activities, two things we do quite often, which are very different. And it's either dumb inspection or logic tests that you don't do in tests. 
So the DOM inspection side of things is everything that has to do with the template or with the user interface. You're checking basically the rendering logic. You're playing with the DOM APIs to use query selector, document get element by type name, things like that. You're also checking for events. So making sure that you have, for example, a navigate event being fired when you click on an element, things like that. So this is really important for your component because uh, the DOM is what the end user sees. But the problem with that is that Jest doesn't uh, cover that. Jest only inspects the JavaScript code. Jest by default is not uh, doing code coverage for your HTML. So it will not know if you have tested all your possible scenarios or your templates are displayed. It's up to you to write that code, but it's not included in test coverage. Also another downside of DOM inspection is that it's not, it's a bit hard to maintain. So if you're using, for example, um, CSS classes to uh, retrieve particular DOM elements, or if you're using specific tag names and the structure of your page changes, you're at risk of breaking your test. So it's a bit more maintenance. Finally, we have a type of tests that you can run or JavaScript logic tests. And this is uh, checking that uh, your JavaScript logic is updating your uh, properties properly. Like for example, when there's an event, you actually react to that event with the right uh, actions. And when you're uh, sending out um, network requests, that you're handling them correctly. Now, this part, however, the logic test is really included in test coverage. So it's easy to track and you're sure that you're not going to miss anything because you have just helping you to identify the lines that are not covered. Now, another good practice when you're doing tests is that make sure you name your test correctly. So here's an example uh, naming convention. Generally, as the suite name, you want to name the unit under test. That means generally the web components that you're testing. So here uh, I've given you an example with the my sessions details um, web component. And then in the terms of test, you generally will have a sentence. The fact that this is a long sentence doesn't matter, but this sentence should cover the expectation and the scenario, so the end results. And again, this is something that reads just like a sentence. It displays session name and speaker when ID is provided. So a bit lengthy, but this is actually very important to have proper names in here because when you work as a team and you have multiple developers writing tests and one of the tests fails or more than one test fails, you'll see the name of the test appearing in the Jest output. So by reading the name of the test, even if you haven't written the test yourself, you should be able to understand what is wrong with the test or what is, what, is it, what is broken, basically. So that's super important to name your test correctly. Other thing that is really important that I demonstrated just earlier, use realistic test data. So ideally, you want to have uh, variable names, um, yeah, data names in there if you use record names or uh, values that are realistic, not just foo bar, things like that. Try to have something that is a bit more realistic because you can catch uh, UI problems easier in an easy way if you do that. Another thing that is super important is that generally don't hard code your um, test values directly in your tests. You want to use constants as often as you can because if you change a constant, you can probably change all your test suites with just a constant. If, you, if you're leaving hard coded values everywhere, it's going to be difficult to change your test values easily. And sometimes you can realize that the test value that you use for your test is probably missing uh, a corner case. So it's always good to have constants in there. Another thing that is quite interesting is the ability to move uh, large test data to JSON files. That's what I showed you earlier. Um, don't hesitate to do that. It's really convenient to be able to import those JSON files and load them uh, and not have all the test data in your JavaScript files because this can really uh, clutter your test code. So make sure you isolate that on the side and also make sure you use constants with that because you can extend the code, uh, the, the, the values that are inside your JSON files without having to rewrite your test. So if you take back the example I showed you, there was a test file with uh, multiple uh, records. So it was showing multiple sessions. There were two sessions that were returned. And in my test, if you paid close attention, I wasn't testing for the number of sessions being displayed was equal to two. I was checking that the number of session was equal to the JSON file length. So that's just an example of how you can adapt your test code so that it's flexible. This way, if I change my JSON file and another fake session to my JSON file, the test will continue to run. We're not stuck with 
having to modify the JSON file and the JS file to update that particular test counter. So that's a good example of how you want to make things a bit more dynamic and use constants. Uh, another general best practice that's actually very uh, practical for working with web components, you want to work with uh, black box testing. So what you want to test first is uh, everything that is publicly vis visible. So that's generally the user interface, the public methods, if you have methods that your component expose, and the events that your component can uh, fire to the parent. Well, this brings another interesting point is that you do not need to reach 100% code coverage to be confident that your, that your component will work. What is important is that the user interface of your component is stable and acts accordingly. This is not included again by the code coverage and generally the UI of your component is actually using your internal JavaScript code. So it does a bit of code coverage without showing up in jest. So that's good to remember. No need to have 100% code coverage, but make sure you cover the different uh, scenarios for your template updates. With that, it's now time for me to conclude and I have a few resources to hand out. Uh, what we've covered so far, we've covered how you test web components with jest. We show you how we did that with Lanimo components, but this is very similar to how you would do it with vanilla web components. We saw how to write behavior-driven tests. Remember the three phases, given, when, then. And lastly, I reminded you that web components can be seen as a black box. You just work on your web component. You don't work on the subcomponents. So that's something to remember. That's specific to web components. Next step, now that you know how to write proper tests, um, the next thing is to automate that with uh, CI. So whatever you choose here uh, will work. Uh, I do recommend uh, a particular CI system if, you, if you're looking for one. GitHub Actions is very, very powerful. I'll be talking about that uh, next week, I think. So if you want to follow me, uh, um, you can learn more about GitHub Actions. But there are plenty of other tools that support running both tests in an automated way. Now, running the tests uh, frequently is one thing, and it's really important. But what you want to do on the longer term is actually monitor code coverage evolution, because your project will likely grow, you'll add new features, and you want to make sure that your code coverage doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't go down. So you want to monitor how the code coverage evolves, making sure you stay to a minimum or between a specific range of values. So that's a tip that I give you on the long run. Now, if you want to learn more about lining web components, uh, we've assembled for you a, a little set of resources. And with that uh, link here, it will take you to a, a series of guided online projects on a platform called Trailhead, which lets you uh, run um, online learning modules uh, that helps you to create the sample application I showed you before. So if you follow that, uh, you'll take uh, an hour or two to create the conference application I built. The sample product here does not include the source code, however, for the test, but you'll be building the component itself. And after that, you can probably watch the recording of the session to add to the tests that are missing. Finally, the last set of resources I want to leave you with, uh, the Jest website, jestjs.io. It's full of uh, documentation for all the different matchers, all the different scenarios, like asynchronous testing, things with timers or web requests. If you want to learn more about testing patterns, for web components, uh, we have a sample application. Uh, the one you'll be looking for is called Recipes, and I've given you the link to our, our gallery of, of web uh, sample applications. And if you look at Recipes open source, this is an application that uses a lot of different patterns and use cases for um, the different testing scenarios. The idea is that it's a collection of recipes or small code samples, which are like 30 lines max of code for very specific use cases like doing iterations or doing uh, composition of components, handling with events, propagation, things like that. More content on web components can be found also on the blog and on Trailhead, which is again our e-learning platform. With that, I'd like to thank you and I can take a few questions. We're out of time, but uh, I can still take a few questions if you have any. Thanks. All right, let's see questions. Hey, Philippe, this is Peter. I've been uh, moderating and going through some questions. Um, if people stay on, um, I'll share a couple of with you. Um, the first one um, is uh, someone was asking if you could take a moment and explain 
open versus closed shadow DOM? Yes. So um, let's simply take an example. So I'm gonna switch back to my um, to the um, to the application here, and when when we look at the source code here, and when we click on one of the elements. You can see that the shadow root, root here is open. And with that, I'm able to expand it and to look into the implementation of this particular shadow, uh, shadow uh, node. If it's closed, this will work as a black box. I will not be able to look at what under this my session list component. In, in our example, we're using open uh, roots only. But in the future, you could use also closed roots, but that hides the actual implementation of the web component to the user. Excellent. And that actually dovetails well into the next question, which is, can you configure LWC to use closed shadow DOM today? Um, that's a good question. Actually, I haven't done that yet. Um, it, it should be possible. I haven't really looked into it um, because all of that is standard. So you can probably add a bit of uh, an extension to the framework. OK. I, I mean, I put the, you know, so my response was not today. In other words, the framework doesn't automatically do it, but that's probably a better question in that the framework is open source. So there are probably things yeah. you could do to take it exactly. and uh, make it do that. Um, good point. Um, and then I'll just do one last question. Um, uh, and this is, this must be somebody from the Salesforce world asking if there's a way to reuse Apex test data here. Uh, in other words, in case we have a data service in an Apex class, could they use their test data? Um, so the idea generally to run, uh, to, run, to run those tests, you generally operate in isolation. So to write proper unit tests, you would not depend on a data source which is located online on the server or something like that. Uh, the ideal way to work would be to um, extract the sample data in a JSON format or a CSV format and to share those files across the different uh, type of tests. But I would re recommend that you do not do any network connections directly in your test. This, go this really goes against the principle of unit testing or isolation of tests. Excellent. Um, so there's lots of also lots of good uh, praise and thanks. There's one bit of feedback that you're missing a single quote on an it on a slide. So I'll be sure to get that to you as well. Well right, done. Thanks. On that. I also well noticed the type that person. Person. Thanks. Okay, I think that's good for now. Um, all the other questions were answered in line, but uh, I just thought I'd call attention to those. All right, thank you. Um, again, if you want to follow and give me more feedback, here's my Twitter handle. Uh, feel free to reach out if you liked it. Uh, there will be a recording of this. Uh, session, I think, in the next coming days. Thank you all. Have a good day or good evening. Bye.